Thank you. Can you eat data? Computer science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are changing drastically the way we produce food today. The secret for this change is collecting vast amount of data. In the next 20 minutes, I want to give you a tour on how big data is used by plant breeding companies to change the way we produce these fruits and vegetables. But now, I have a question for all of you. And by raising your hand, how many of you knows about bioinformatics? Well, pretty much. But how many of you knows about big data? Oh, OK. So <laughs> good that we're having this talk right now. So bioinformatics and big data are related because big data refer to a large collection of data sets, usually heterogeneous, pictures, large tables. And we use bioinformatics and computer science uh, in order to identify patterns, trends, and associations in these data sets. 20 years ago, um, we started to collect uh, these uh, pictures, uh, essentially, for identifying uh, the seed or shapes to distinguish which one are healthy and which one are not. But then technology changed, and we started to use also big data to identify which genes are responsible for uh, better looking and better tasting fruits. Ultimately, it's very important also to ask big data why a plant is resistant to a deadly disease. In the next uh, 10 years, uh, it's very important uh, that we're going to tackle climate change. And uh, big data, it's really fundamental from this point of view. Um, a bit by myself, uh, 20 years ago when I started to study biology, I was fascinated about bioinformatics, the field in biology that helped in making sense of biological data. The idea of building your own algorithm to solve the complex and long and tedious tasks, it's fascinating and empowering and satisfying. Today, I was really impressed to see how bioinformatics is so central to plant breeding and to biology itself. You see, biology is becoming more and more a data-driven science. And I want to show you how. So what you can see here is um, a container with a lot of tomato seeds. Can any of you guess how many seeds this container contains? Anyone? 5,000? 10,000? 100,000? 100,000. 100,000. OK. We have a million of tomato seeds in this container. And I know what's your question now. How do you know it's a million? You can keep this question for later. But the important thing is that if you look at the size of these tomato seeds, they're really tiny. So why I'm showing you this right now? If you look at the volume of this single seed of tomato compared with this million of seed, this is the same change that happened in data production from sequencing technology 10 years ago compared with today. This is a staggering amount of data. Today, data is the new oil, with the difference that oil is running out. But data, well, according to that trend, we are just going up. If I'm going to give you the same presentation in three years from now, we are going to fill this entire stage with a thousand of these containers. And this is possible simply because uh, of the new revolution bring, uh, brought by uh, sequencing technology. I want to show you now another prop that I brought here on stage. This, oh, actually, this. It's a flow cell of a third generation sequencing machine. It's very small, and if you actually look at the picture on the screen, you can see the device to which this is mounted on. That machine is the size of a small remote controller, like this. On that, we can load the DNA samples, some chemical reagents, plug it to a laptop, and start to unravel the DNA sequence 
in just five hours of time. So if you compare also how the generation change in time from 20 years ago to today, first generation sequencing machines were capable of sequencing one single fragment of DNA, hundreds of base pair long. Second generation, we, decided, we, we finally managed to scale this up. The chemical reactions were very similar, we just made millions of fragments at a time. With third generation, we actually saw a shift in paradigm, and now we can sequence millions of fragments, uh, almost a million of base per long, so it's a thousand or even more times longer. And for those of you that are people of culture in the audience, uh, you can see the scale of these machines and how miniaturization is playing a big role in sequencing technology today. So, what is sequencing? Well, you should know, but sequencing is the process of determining the order of the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T, uh, of the DNA molecule. That is the blueprint of life of every living being, plants included. The goal of uh, the DNA is to be translated into a protein, small molecular machines that achieve any task within and outside the cells. During the duplication process, sometimes, some error occur. And this is a natural process that happens every day and it's the very basic of evolution. In this case, a C is being converted into a T by, er by error. If that mutation happens in a part of the DNA that translates for a protein, this is translated down to the same protein. And depending on the function of the protein, we might disrupt an important function, then the organism dies. Sometimes these mutations are silent, and means we don't see any further effect on top of that. And sometimes, very few times, these mutations are actually giving an advantage, and the organism thrives. What is really fundamental here to know is that because these mutations are inherited from one generation to the other, we can collect them and use them as a fingerprint to distinguish which variety is from any other. And up to the tree of life, we can even identify why and when a plant uh, or any organism, actually, just a, a fork on the tree of life I mean, in two different species. And now I want to tell you another piece of story. Maybe you relate. Every time I go to the grocery store, I want, to, I want to buy fruits and veggies. So I go to the grocery store, I reach for the basket with fruits, and the first thing I do, I'm just going to pick up the first fruit and look at that, maybe a tomato. And then I don't like it, and I put it back. So I took the second one, and the second one is full of wrinkles. I don't like even this one, and I put it back. Finally, I take the third one, and this is the one. I put it in the basket, and then I go to, to the checkout. You see, that process of touching fruits over and over again sometimes can have very bad consequences. An example happened in 2014. An outbreak of a pandemic eh, for tomatoes. And the virus was from the Tobamo genus. It started in Israel and it was spreading by touch. And because of that and the high replication rate of the virus, it was very difficult to contain it. So in time, in very limited amount of time, it spread to Europe, Asia, America, Africa. Plant pathologists started to study different wild tomatoes in order to identify which plant is actually capable of resisting this virus. And we found that. So we found a plant resistant to that, and you can see the difference in two different tomatoes in the picture. One full of spots, and the other one that's typical red tomato. So when we search for differences, we just let the plants get attacked by the virus, but if it's resistant, you don't see the spots appearing on the tomato. And as a breeding company, you don't want to put on the market a, a tomato that is full of spots at the end. So, we found the gene 
that was responsible for conferring resistance to this virus. Uh, and through the usage of the mutations I was just telling you before, we managed to tell to our crop scientists which kind of crosses needed to be done to make sure that we can move through means of uh, typical prime breeding processes, uh, how to in introgress the gene in the commercial variety. So now we can sell again tomatoes without being affected by the virus. So these mutations, uh, this shows that these mutations can be really helpful too. They are a molecular tool actually that can really speed up the process in this sense. But how do we find them? So you can imagine this is a three-step approach. First, we have to collect the DNA sample. And the first thing we do, we smash it in very small pieces. Then we load these this fragments in a sequencer and through some chemical reaction and a lot of pictures taken by the sequencer, we can finally unravel the sequence of each of these individual fragments. And we call them sequencing reads. Next, we take each individual sequencing read, and the goal is building a gigantic puzzle with millions and millions of pieces. And to do that, we use a reference sequence, something that is available, publicly available, like in this case for tomato, and we use it as a basic to just helping us in building the puzzle. So we scan with each fragment the DNA of the tomato sequence, and until we find the position where it belongs. When you found it, you stick it there. And you repeat this process over and over for all the fragments. Sometimes you find that some nucleotides are just completely different from the one you expect. We expected a G in this case, but we found an A. We call this a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. And these are the mutations that we want to collect because we can use it as a molecular tool. In this process, because we do a, a scan through all over the genome, we can collect thousands and thousands of them, and we can use them as a fingerprint to distinguish varieties from each other. But you see, the complexity for building this is not ending here. The plant genomes have a very complex genome compared to humans. We have in plant genomes uh, way more duplications. It means some part of the genome are just duplicated over and over and over again across all genome. Other times we find inversion, some parts that are completely twist over when you compare with the reference genome or with other genomes. And other times, well, they are completely absent. And to make things even more difficult, eh? to date, Worldwide, we have 600 genomes com uh, almost completed for all the plants in the world. And of these 600, they are all in draft state. That means they are actually not finished because we have a lot of gaps in it. Maybe you heard just two weeks ago that the human genome finally has been completed after more than two decades. And the reason that that happened is because we only had 8% that it was not possible to map because of high repetitions in the human genome. In plants, we have more of that. But the goal to complete the human genome was possible because of third generation sequencing technology. If you look at what um, a second generation technology could do, it's producing just a vast amount of short reads. They are cheap, it's easy to do, but because they are short, Sometimes we are not really certain where to put each of these. But with long read sequencing coming from third generation sequencing technology, we can just completely span all over a region eh? and therefore completing each gap. Using only one genome as a reference is also a bit of a limiting concept. It would be the equivalent of saying that a white Caucasian male genome is representing the entire variability of the entire human population. It's kind of a weird concept, and for plants applies at the same level. So following the booming of uh, genomic projects and sequencing, follow also the idea of pangenomic. So how do we represent the entire genetic variability of a species? 
If you look at this figure, for example, here we have three different varieties of tomato. It's a cartoon. It's a simplification. But in this case, we have three different genomes, and we know the location of some of these genes. So when we want to work with pangenomics, we want to be able to sequence all individuals of a species, ideally. Why? Because then we can start to cross this information, and we can start to check, for example, which genes are in common across all individuals, which only with some, and which are unique to some individuals only. Now, in this example, you can see the gene number one is shared with all individuals. Gene number two and three are just shared between two individuals out of three. And gene number four is a unique gene. It belongs only to one variety. So if you look at this from this perspective, now you can start to think about uh, pangenomics also as a tool in the future for targeting medicine, for example, also for plants. Uh, if you want to target an entire species, you will be more successful if you target the core pangenome. Why? Because all the genes that are in the core are shared across all your individuals. If you want to target only a subtype uh, or just a, a, a few groups of your entire species, then you want to check on the variable pangenome. And as I said before, we have personalized medicine for humans, but this doesn't remove the fact that we want to treat plants. So unique pangenome is where we want to uh, find the genes to target only a specific subtype or even just an individual. An interesting concept that is coming out from different uh, uh, research papers right now is that uh, most of the variability that is helping us fighting the disease is actually coming from the unique part of the genome of all the plants that we are inputting into our pangenomics. So plant breeding is a fascinating field. We work at the front of innovation and uh, to make sure that every day we can feed billions of people with healthy fruits and vegetables. And you see already that climate change and the outbreak of disease with pandemics, they are just a big trouble. And we need big data to start to find correlations and trends and patterns uh, uh, to how to unravel them and how to solve these problems. But as you can see, the, da the data today is not the problem anymore. In three years from now, we will be completely submerged by data. What is missing is bioinformaticians, data scientists. So this is my request to all of you. We need more scientists that works with algorithm. We need more scientists that are capable to think about how to dig inside this incredible treasure trove of data. So my request to you is just join this race because plant breeding is really fun and we can just make this an incredible achievement. Thank you. <laughs>